Okay, this is a review of Racial Formation by Michael Omi and Howard Winant from Race, Class, and Gender, 10th edition. Okay, so race is a social construct. The social construction of race just means that the meanings around race change over time due to the historical processes and social pressures that shape our experiences and perspectives on race. Race is constantly changing. And the racial state rearticulates the racial hegemony as time passes in many ways, which we'll explore in just a minute. So race is an organizing principle. Race structures our life experiences and opportunities differently depending on our place in a white supremacist racial hierarchy. We see racial divisions as important culturally, and we have many definitions, stigmas, stereotypes, and prejudices that we learn and reproduce in interactions to maintain the racial hegemony of white supremacy. It is an intersection of the macro and the micro, of the larger racial projects and racial state, to the everyday lived experiences of inequality and marginality that result from the racial state. So what is the racial state? The racial state is a common facilitator of macro and micro level processes, as we just literally just discussed. The racial state determines the trajectory of race relations. So through government, which enacts laws or rules and court decisions that have consequences that affect racial and ethnic minorities differently, while on the other hand, privileging whiteness and assimilation. The hegemony is, of race is reinforced through the racial state as it determines the hegemony of racial formations, but it can also challenge or change those hegemonies. The concept of race, its meaning in contemporary society, shows the difficulty of defining race and assigning individuals or groups to racial categories. Understanding racial formation theory helps us see how racial legacies of the past, such as slavery and bigotry or Jim Crow segregation, continue to shape the present. But the best way to explain it is with their words from the reading. Quote, It reveals both the deep involvement of the state in the organization and interpretation of race and the inadequacy of the state institutions to carry out these functions. It demonstrates how deeply Americans, both as individuals and as a civilization, are shaped and indeed haunted by race. Okay, so racial projects. What are racial projects? They are both the cultural meanings of racial groups, as well as the effort to organize and distribute resources along racial lines. A racial project is a broad category. So this means it's both the macro and the micro, the large state and institutional interventions, and the individual experiences and actions around race, such as the decision of how to wear your hair, just by embracing a natural hairstyle like an afro or wearing dreadlocks. This can also be a micro experience of a racial project. So what makes these things racial is how they connect to larger patterns of race. Sometimes they conform to those standards and other times they challenge them. The racial formation process itself is the interaction and accumulation of all of these different projects. So what are some examples of racial projects? Well, mass incarceration. This is something we discuss at length in my criminology course, and something we will discuss in this class later on. But in brief, the criminal justice system has been affected in its structure by racial ideology and racial definitions. To give a quick snapshot of Michelle Alexander's argument in The New Jim Crow, the system of mass incarceration, in her view, is a modern racial caste system that defines what it means to be African American in American society. She connects this system with its predecessors of slavery and Jim Crow segregation. In the briefest explanation I can give possible, she argues that the racial caste systems, or these racial projects, define the meanings of African Americans. So she says that during slavery, to be black meant to be property, stripped of humanity. That during Jim Crow segregation, to be black meant to be a second class citizen, inferior in the eyes of the law. And lastly, she argues that in modern day racial caste system of mass incarceration that has targeted communities of color through the guise of the war on drugs, that the meanings of being black today is to be criminal or assumed to be deviant. Another racial project example would be ICE and tough on immigrant policies that target immigrants, migrants, and even asylum seekers on the southern border of the United States. Policies force those crossing the border to bear the harsh desert 
resulting in many deaths each year. And even those activists who place water out in the desert so people do not die are targeted and arrested and the water is dumped out by border enforcement. In recent years, Border Patrol even shot a kid on the Mexico side of the U.S. border at the fence and was not held accountable in any way. Of course, we already had the Obama administration, who Obama was dubbed the deporter-in-chief because of his record level of deportations. But during the Trump administration, this is elevated to children being separated from their families, locked in dog kennels, sometimes in situations where toddlers are being cared for by children as young as seven years old, also incarcerated in those same facilities. As we'll discuss later, there's a lot of connections between the system of mass incarceration and detention and enforcement against undocumented immigrants, which is why it's often referred to as a crimmigration system. Um, national security is another racial project. When you look at national security, we see a focus on racial and ethnic minorities and surveillance of rights movements. For example, Malcolm X's entourage had FBI informants planted in it. And one of them said of him in 1958 that he was a quote, man of high moral character, end quote. But that didn't stop them from surveilling his every move. MLK was the, also a target of J. Edgar Hoover, who headed the FBI, who bugged his calls, who planted informants in his entourage and monitored his every move. The parallels between this history and the vilifying and monitoring of Black Lives Matter organizers and protesters is sobering. As when people of color demand to be treated with basic humanity, the government sees it as a threat to the social order. History tragically repeats itself because we learn so little from it. Also, today, when we think of national security, it's often terrorism. And the racialization of the word affects how we come to understand safety and threat in America. One of those Trump-era stories that made little impact because he just does 10 more things that day before the reporting is in. But basically, he removed a statement on domestic terrorism from a 2020 FBI assessment of threats to the homeland in which they said the biggest threat to security is domestic terrorists in the form of white supremacists and neo-Nazi militias. This is not only an example of upholding hegemony of white supremacy, but also the lengths we will go to as a culture to reify the power structures of white supremacy, that it's more important to us not to offend skinheads than to protect the public from their numerous killing sprees and mass shootings. There's so many examples of people that are emboldened by this, this rhetoric and Trump, even himself, such as the El Paso shooter, who quoted Trump's invasion of migrants rhetoric to justify mass murder. Another racial project are housing policies like redlining and other discrimination that reinforce residential segregation, which also creates educational inequalities and segregated schools. So redlining was a process where banks and other institutions refused mortgages and offered worse rates to customers in certain neighborhoods based on the neighborhood's racial and ethnic composition. Very clear example of a racial project or of systematic racism in action. The practice was formally outlawed in 1968 because of the Fair Housing Act, but it continues in many ways in the modern day. I mean, if you look at the old maps, there are places where the segregation mirrors when it was enforced because ending a policy doesn't fix the ramifications of it. The process of redlining had its roots in the 50 years after emancipation during the Reconstruction era, when selective zoning laws enforced housing and pro prohibited sale of homes to African Americans. When a Supreme Court ruling in 1917 said it was no longer legal, they were replaced with racial restrictive covenants, which are agreements between property owners to ban the sale of homes in a neighborhood to create a certain racial or ethnic group. So basically, a whole group of homeowners coming together to say, we're going to make sure we exclude one racial group from moving into the neighborhood. Even though those covenants were also later made illegal, but by that point, the government had become involved in housing through the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA. After the Great Depression, they wanted people to buy homes, so they incentivized home ownership, but they did it in a racially segregated way, producing redlining as a policy which labeled black neighborhoods as hazardous, and FHA loans were not provided in these areas. This connects pretty directly to the GI Bill, which was the largest affirmative action program that lifted many working class whites out of poverty by offering them incentives such as low interest home loans so that a mortgage became cheaper than rent. There's also job priority that comes with the GI Bill, so preferential job treatment and financial support during their job searches. There's also small business loans, right? Small loans that people can use for small business startups. And importantly, the GI Bill provided educational benefits, including tuition 
and living expenses that provided a path to middle-class careers with more pay and benefits. These policies lifted many out of poverty, but they were not equitably applied, and service members of color were denied or often given limited opportunities. For example, if someone receives the benefits to buy a home, but then racial housing discrimination means that the white person gets the house while the service member of color is redlined or restricted by racial covenants from moving into the suburbs, at the same time, jobs left those inner city redlined communities, leaving people in desperate poverty. These policies still affect people in the modern day communities, as those communities that were labeled red or yellow are still less developed and lack basic services, Often there are scarce jobs, so we can see how these policies can be ended in a legal sense, but they still have real lived impact today on millions of Americans. So racial formation is the social and historical processes by which groups come to be defined in racial terms. The definitions themselves are in the processes of the state, such as laws.